So thanks everybody for coming. Thanks in particular to Gail for being our presenter today. This is the latest in our slightly grandly titled social analysis of penalty across boundaries series. If anybody can think of something catchier, that would be great. Thank you. Um, and it's a great pleasure to introduce Gail Super, well known to many here for her extensive work in the sociology of punishment, especially but not exclusively with reference to South Africa. Um, Gail works at the University of Toronto Mississauga in the sociology department and um, has done lots of really interesting work in penal policy making, violence and authority in the old and new South Africa. Um, and the paper that she's going to talk to us about today on cars, compounds and containers is, I think, a version of one that's very recently appeared in Punishment Society, so we can also go and check it out afterwards if you haven't read it already. Um, without further ado, Gail, thank you. Over to you. Thanks very much for inviting me to talk here today. So I'm just going to attempt to share my screen. So can you give me a thumbs up if you can see it? Great, thanks. Okay, so yes, as Richard mentioned, this paper is based on an article that was published in Punishment and Society earlier in the year. And um, in it, I look at infrastructures of vigilante violence in former black townships and informal settlements in South Africa. I focus on two specific techniques. Firstly, when someone is forced into the trunk or boot of a vehicle and driven around in order to locate stolen property. And secondly, when a person is temporarily detained, assaulted or tortured in a garage, shack, old shipping container or other local public space. And these incidents of violence are framed in the police database under the common law offense of kidnapping, which is colloquially called man stealing. And they're usually combined with alternative charges such as murder, attempted murder, assault, GBH, etc. Like police torture, vigilante kidnappings are more furtive and private rituals than public acts. And they differ from spectacular incidents of collective violence where a suspected offender is publicly burnt, stoned or beaten to death by a crowd of people. I use the term extrajudicial penal violence to refer to punitive violence that is inflicted beyond the courts. Strictly speaking, this is not punishment because it's imposed beyond the courts and there's no, you know, there's no criminal case resulting in a conviction. But those on the receiving end definitely experience it as punishment and sometimes the instigators themselves intend it to be punishment. Like law, extrajudicial penal violence is multiscalar and spatio-temporally plural. It assumes distinct forms and plays out differently depending on where in space and time it is inflected. So this multiscalarity is highly visible in historically marginalized spaces and in contexts of inequality. And you can see this famous photograph by Johnny Miller, which was on the cover of Time magazine, um, sort of epitomizes the spatial inequality in South Africa. On the one side of the picture, you have Masako Malele, which is a black township, high density consisting of um, you know, houses on top of each other and lots of shacks. And then on the other side, you have Lake Michelle, which is an affluent community, largely white and um, low density luxury housing. And in the middle, there's this green buffer zone. Although kidnapping uh, at first glance seems to be the opposite of lawfully exercised state power, I argue that it reflects, amplifies and distorts the violence that is exercised by the state in support of its claimed monopoly over lawful and hence from the state's point of view, legitimate penal power. The boundary between lawful and unlawful violence is a porous one. 
So, for example, when the police arrest, it's not regarded as kidnapping because they do so for an allegedly lawful purpose. But as we know, police arrests are often unlawful, whether because they use excessive violence during the course of the arrest or because they are actually arresting for an unlawful purpose. The extrajudicial civilian-led penal violence that I discuss in the paper exists in close proximity to state practices of policing and punishment. I argue that car trunks, shacks, shipping containers, and other commonplace receptacles function as the underside of official institutions such as prisons and police lockups, and that they bear deep historical imprints and institutional legacies of the extrajudicial punishments that were inflicted on black bodies during colonialism and apartheid. They also serve as important reminders of the uneasy relationship between local meanings of justice and liberal legality in terms of the criminal justice system. So while official or state punishment uh, relies on the infrastructure of the criminal justice system, such as prisons, police vehicles, police cells, lockups, handcuffs, etc. Those who inflict extrajudicial punishment in marginalized spaces tap into infrastructures which are located in or on the margins of the state. In South Africa, the law itself created spatial exclusions and spaces of marginality via legislation which both established and compelled the majority of residents to live in racially segregated townships. So spatial forms of economic and social inequality are particularly marked, as you can see in, in, in these two photographs. In the, you know, in, on, in the one photograph, you've got a shack in the wetlands area of Masipumalele, which is an informal settlement. And then in the distance, you see the beautiful Cape Mountains that make Cape Town so popular with tourists. I draw on the concept of subversive mimesis, which is used by Feldman in his book Formations of Violence, but which is also a term from critical art theory. So imitation or mimesis is subversive. In other words, it functions as a strategy of resistance when it appropriates and subverts the original. Through over-identification, it reveals the obscenity. So in my case, it's the violence which underpins the state's lawful power to punish. So subversive mimesis reveals the obscenity um, that's at the heart of the original, but at the same time, it also produces more violence. In making the argument that everyday infrastructures are the underside or shadow of formal infrastructures of punishment, I'm not claiming an equivalency. So I'm not claiming that there is a direct or linear connection between the prison and between the trunk of a car or a shack. But rather that there is a similarity in the nature of the power itself and the use of violence against those who threaten or violate social norms. So the primary research that I used uh, consisted of an analysis of computerized Excel spreadsheets, thousands of pages that were that came from six police stations um, in South Africa for the years 2000 and 2000 and, to, to 2016. So the police stations were in the Kailitsha and in Yanga clusters, which are former black townships. At the time of my research, these stations had close to the highest rates of recorded violent crimes in the country. They are also notorious for incidents of lethal vigilante violence. I conducted an initial automated search of the database using the search terms that you can see on the screen for the crimes of arson, um, assault GBH, attempted murder, public violence, kidnapping, and murder. So the reason I had to use these search terms is that the police don't actually use the term vigilantism or vigilante violence very much at all, and there is no statutory offence of vigilante violence. So I, after I um, did this automated search, I then read the comments columns in order to determine whether the cases were connected to the prevention, investigation, or punishment of crime. And if they were, I categorize them as vigilante violence. 
By selecting data from these very violent archives, I do risk sensationalizing what are in essence tragic fragments of people's lives. However, there's also violence in not knowing and in not exposing what many in South African society and beyond turn a blind eye to. So I'm going to briefly discuss legal pluralism and extrajudicial penal violence in a historical context before discussing contemporary kidnappings and confinements. So the type of state that the European colonizers imposed onto African colonies was different to that in the metropole. Tactics of penal violence such as corporal punishment and criminalization combined with processes of expulsion and dispossession to produce spaces of marginalization. In this context, infrastructures such as compounds, mines, townships, and hostels were carceral in design to facilitate surveillance and control, and they permitted a plethora of actors to punish lawfully in support of or justified by the pursuit of summary justice. So you can see in this photograph of the um, compound at the Kimberley Diamond Mine, which housed workers, which housed black workers. You can see you know, how much like a prison it actually looks. So this pursuit of summary justice was also enabled by poorly trained administrative officials who exercised judicial, legislative, and executive powers against black subjects, mostly via regulation. And so it was beyond the over judicial oversight. As Chanak notes, this pluralist legal approach explicitly sanctioned violence and patriarchal power relations and subjected Black Africans, and I'm using his words, to an extensive localized and legally arbitrary form of rule. The courts generally accepted the evidence of white experts who embraced an authoritarian view of what customary law was. So local chiefs and headmen could impose unreviewable orders and fines over their subjects, along with imprisonment for non-compliance. Traditional heads of rural households could also lawfully inflict reasonable punishment for the purposes of discipline. Penal violence was an essential part of this thrust towards summary justice for natives. Apart from the power of summary arrest over anyone who defied his authority, native commissioners, who were invariably always male, were given delegated powers of punishment, which wasn't subject to judicial review. Mining compounds had stockies, small wooden huts, where miners could be locked up for a few days and punished for so-called minor offences, and it was standard for black workers to be detained without pay after their contracts ended to ensure that they hadn't stolen any diamonds. And you can see in this um, photograph the demeaning way in which the white foreman is searching um, black workers and you know, they, they're getting laxative, laxative so that they can eject the diamonds, etc. White farmers also used to lock up their laborers at night. So these forms of detention were illegal, but they were largely tolerated. And the use of violence to control wage laborers um, by boss boys, boss boys on farms, and by indunas, chiefs on mines, was common. Like mining compounds, black townships were designed to enable maximum control with minimal effort. They were situated as far as possible from white neighborhoods, but close to the industrial area so that they could provide a source of cheap labor. And there were a limited number of access roads. So as Mills notes, their geometrically formal, internally identical street pattern was confusing to navigate if you were an outsider, but because it was legible from above, it also provided a way to concentrate together and control a large amount of people. So this diagram um, is of the 1953 layout for the Wittbank native township. And you can see the national road on the one side, and uh, which is a border, and then the other natural border of a river on the other side. And then in the middle, you can see the geometrically formal internal layout. So once the National Party gained 
power in 1948, it poured enormous resources into continuing the forcible relocation of Black people to the urban periphery and also to Bantustans, which are homelands in impoverished rural areas. The apartheid state was more concerned with protecting white citizens from crime than, than from, than, uh, you know, uh, with white citizens from crime from the supposedly threat, a uh, criminal threat posed by Black people than it was with the prevention of, of crime inside Black townships and in Bantustan. So there were very few police stations in Black townships. Township residents were forced to rely on interpersonal and patronage networks as forms of security and vigilante associations were common. There were about 2,000 enforced disappearances under apartheid, most of them perpetrated by members of the police security branch and the counterinsurgency unit during the 1980s when the National Party government resorted to increasingly violent and underhand tactics to fight against the SWAT and the Royal Gefahr, the Black and the Red Danger. So the case of Similani, um, whose photographs you can see in the slide, she was an anti-apartheid activist and she was last seen in the trunk of a policeman's car in 1983. She was tortured and detained at a block of flats and thereafter at a farm in the northern part of the country. And this is just one example of how cars, boots, flats, farms were deployed as infrastructures in the disappearances and extrajudicial punishments secretly carried out by the state in the name of security. So this inflection of horrific and deeply punitive violence by apartheid state operatives shaped counter-violence by the comrades against impimpis, spies, the police, the hated community councillors and other apartheid collaborators inside black townships. Petrol bombing, arson, stoning and necklacing were far more common than abductions and tortures, although some counter-violence did include these technologies. So the state's excessive use of violence created forms of resistance that mimicked and distorted and exaggerated the state's original violence. And this engendered further spirals of violence and precipitated new forms of violence. And this is where the mimetic reciprocity argument uh, comes in. During the 1980s campaign of ungovernability, the line between what was a political crime and what was ordinary crime became increasingly blurred. And many, and well, not, you know, some popular justice initiatives against collaborators and apartheid spies sometimes collapsed into violent punishments for ordinary criminal offenses, such as theft or the use of drugs. Beatings were inflicted by some people's courts. And liberation movements in exile also results, uh, relied heavily on flogging as a disciplinary technique with harsh punishments meted out against deviants in the camps, including tying offenders to trees and locking them in windowless containers. So in this um, painting, you can see Oliver Tambo, who was the then president of the ANC, and he's visiting uh, prisoners held in the ANC's prison camp called Quattro. By the time the first democratic elections were held in 1994, there was a deep historical legacy of instant justice in which violence played a central role. Extrajudicial civilian led penal violence is now largely deployed against the generic as opposed to the political criminal. So while it appears to be gratuitous, it is subversively mimetic in as much as it confirms the logic of, this, of, this, of the state's right to punish it renders its violence explicit, but it also challenges the state's claim to monopolize punishment. So the post-1994 South African state has embraced community policing alongside with punitive and exclusionary discourses and practices of crime control. In both rich and poor areas, it is the unemployed young black male who is now accused of criminality and who is vulnerable to violence by both the police and others. Affluent people living in formerly whites only areas enjoy the benefits and resources of infrastructure such as private security, electrified fences, 
gated communities, insurance um, policies, vehicles, more, more police stations, and just better access to the criminal justice system. And this photograph is of Bishop's Court. It's a very posh area in Cape Town where there are you know, lots of mansions. And you can see there's electric fences, there's 24-hour security, etc. In marginalized spaces, however, everyday infrastructures and objects are adapted to serve multiple purposes including that of punishment. So a piece of wire can be transformed into a handcuff, a boot into the back of a police vehicle, a beach into a death or torture chamber. In one case, someone was accused of stealing his neighbor's property and was forcibly taken to a community hall, which was temporarily transformed into a people's court. After the female participants were ordered to leave the hall, it morphed into a violent interrogation center in which the accused was suffocated with a plastic bag, strangled and beaten with a plastic shambok, which is a whip. Despite the severity of the assault, the police comments record no serious injuries. In another case, a young man was abducted and assaulted so badly that he had to spend a week in hospital with an intercostal drain in his chest. He was beaten with a firearm, wood and hammer, forced into the boots of a car, a small car, and driven around to find stolen property. He took his abductors to a container like the one you see in this picture, it doubled up as a shop for, sell for selling stolen goods during the day. But because it was closed, his assailants forced his head under a tap, continued to beat him. Then they wrapped him up in a blanket, put him back into the boot of a car and drove him to another container where they intended to incarcerate him for the night. The plan was thwarted when the police arrived on the scene and heard him screaming. Two years later, after a process of court-ordered mediation, the charges against the assailants were withdrawn on the condition that they apologized and paid in 1,500 rand, which is about 100 US dollars. 100 dollars for a week in hospital, a broken leg, stitches in the head, back, face, and a collapsed lung. One has to ask whether this would have happened had, a, had the person not been a young black male from a marginalized former black township. So given, like, like, like the one you see in this photograph, given an overall lack of insurance cover, recovering stolen property is central to residents' sense of justice and having access to a vehicle renders this more feasible. However, because car ownership is relatively low in these marginalized high-risk areas, to use insurance company terminology, the owners or drivers of minibus taxis, colloquially known as quantums or tatas, play a key role in producing, in, in providing these services, which often aren't free. So in the context of a police force which lacks sufficient vehicles with which to investigate crime, it is unsurprising that the ubiquitous quantum minibuses are used as, um, they sometimes function as quasi police vehicles. They, they track down stolen goods and they collect evidence. The term quantum came up repeatedly in the police database. Although I also found less organized instances of sedan style vehicles, which were temporarily transformed into vectors of violence. In South Africa's marginalized spaces, vehicles function as crucial infrastructures of mobility, as spaces of confinement, discipline, and specters of death, particularly when someone is taken away and never seen again. So the sequence of events plays out along these lines. A car with approximately six men stops in front of a home. They ask about the whereabouts of stolen property or of a person, and they leave with someone in the boot or the trunk. So being cramped inside the windowless space of a boot has disciplinary, retributive, and instrumental effects. While the vehicle itself is a means from traveling from point A to point B, the effect of being confined inside the trunk not only disciplines the captive into confessing, but also raises the very real possibility of death. So as such, it functions as a space where a human being is transformed into an other, against whom a formidable right to punish is established, to use Foucault's words. So when a quantum arrives unsummoned outside someone's house in the dead of night, it is indeed like a spectre, something ominous and foreboding, 
Seeing a vehicle full of people is a harbinger of the transformation through violence, which is to come. In one case, 10 men drove off with a 23 year old who lived in a shack in his father's backyard at 10 o'clock at night. He was never seen again. Sometimes victims are tied to the tow bar and dragged behind a car. Sometimes the extractive nature of the violence is blatantly obvious, as in the case where five men kicked down the door to a shack, forced two brothers into their quantum, drove them to the taxi rank where they punched, shambocked and stabbed them with screwdrivers because the brothers had allegedly stolen their tires. So the brothers ended up paying 4,000 Rand, $275, even though they denied having stolen the tires. In another case, after a stolen DVD player and an amplifier were found inside a shack, the vigilantes proceeded to take everything that they wanted out of the shack. And so they took far more than the value of the stolen goods. Sometimes people are driven to Manwabizi Beach, which was reserved for blacks only during apartheid. It borders the western side of Kailitsha, and it's on a stunning but dangerous stretch of the Atlantic coastline. When people are taken there at night, it is temporarily transformed from a space of beauty and leisure into a space of violence and death. In one case, a 23 year old was abducted while he was at work. He was driven to a graveyard thereafter to the beach where he was tortured for a prolonged period in retaliation for having robbed someone in an informal settlement a few days earlier. During the five hour assault, he was struck with bricks, stabbed with sharp objects, burnt with uh, molten plastic, forced to drink seawater and eat sand, and taken back to the graveyard where he was left for dead. In another case, two brothers who were accused of stealing their neighbor's laptop were brutally assaulted with shambox. They were forced into the car's trunk and taken, uh, driven around to locate the community, um, to locate the computer, which they denied having stolen. And their abductors threatened to throw them into the sea, which due to strong currents, and because many residents in former black townships can't swim, is akin to a death sentence. So while the common garden shed might serve as a space to keep tools and gardening equi equipment in the leafy middle-class suburbs, and also it also houses security guards um, on the perimeters of the properties of mansions. In former black townships and informal settlements, those who can't afford um, or can't access formal bricks and mortar houses, they live in corrugated iron shacks known as ihoki and in garden sheds, which are colloquially known as Wendy houses, but in closer as Ichochombe. They also double up as spaces and sites of in incarceration for the purpose of punishment and torture. In one instance, a police officer found two people inside a locked shed in someone's backyard. One of them was semi-conscious, unable to walk or speak with multiple wounds. The other had been beaten and burnt with molten plastic all over his body because the owner of the house suspected that they were thieves and had presumably been torturing them in order to get information. One photograph in a police docket showed a garage which had been temporarily converted into a torture chamber. So here, mechanical instruments, such as those you see in this, in this uh, photograph, um, chains and winches doubled up as instruments of torture and confinement. These processes both mirror and distort the central role that arrest and interrogation play in the construction of state power. And they mimic the state's search and seizure practices. It's viscerally obvious when focusing on the material infrastructures which non-state actors draw on to exercise penal power that extrajudicial policing, including torture, is prone to collapse into punishment. But in South Africa and elsewhere, communities are encouraged to take responsibility for their own policing and citizens' arrests are lawful. So while forcible confinement in a shack or container doesn't have the authority of law, and it's not a prison or police lockup in the legal sense of the term, it fulfills a similar, albeit exaggerated function um, to that of lawful incarceration. So the boundaries between torturing just enough to gain information and violent extrajudicial punishment are so porous as to render the distinction between them inane. There are also numerous examples 
of the police and other state um, agents engaging in exactly the same practices. So um, I'm just going to make some concluding remarks. Walter Benjamin argues that law is founded on and preserved through violence. South Africa's history of racialized dispossession, segregation, state-sanctioned forms of extrajudicial violence by, by a plethora of actors, these all played key roles in producing a template for current forms of penal violence. So South Africa presents an excellent case study of the relationship between law and its violent other. The expulsive and spatial, um, the expulsive spatial practices which were legislated for in law resulted in a deeply spatialized form of legal pluralism. And this spatialization plays out in the ways that everyday infrastructures are used to fulfill multiple functions, including penal ones. So in former black townships and informal settlements, it's the boots, the shack, the shed, the car, the minibus taxi, which play multiple roles, including as vectors and spaces of confinement, torture and execution. In middle class and more affluent areas, residents use differently violent tactics. They contract out to security guards, they install electric fences, they have well-resourced neighborhood watchers, which they can use to sort of racially banish anybody who threatens them. So spatiotemporality is crucial to both how penal forms permeate space and time and to how space and time permeate penal forms. Liberal penal theory, and maybe even the field of punishment and society, tends to limit the idea of punishment to an ideal, to what should happen, but in doing so, it fails to acknowledge the multiscolarity of penal violence, including legal forms. When we incorporate what happens in practice, as opposed to restricting it to what should happen, the picture changes considerably. Extrajudicial punishment isn't a post-conviction event, but it's an ongoing process, which starts well before conviction, if there is a conviction at all. Torture, unofficial confinement, and coercive mobilization play central roles. These penal forms mimic, distort, and amplify the violence that underpins the state's unrealized monopoly over the violence inherent in its own claims to police and punish. At the same time, it's not always possible to tease apart the reasons and motivations behind lawful and unlawful punitive violence. So just as the boundaries between law and violence are porous, so too are those between vigilantism and organized crime, and between the, the various penal forms which constitute extrajudicial punishment. Vigilantes sometimes have criminal records, and the same or similar technologies and infrastructures are just, are, you know, are used for multiple, sometimes conflicting purposes. So this has implications for the mainstream and reductionist claim, which is very popular in South Africa, that an inefficient criminal justice system causes uh, vigilantism. All we have to do is put more police into the townships and then we we'll, won't have vigilantism. The post-1994 South African state embraced a punitive approach to crime, and this was unevenly implemented. So this unevenness was both a product of, and it also produced more spatial inequality. And although the generic criminal has now replaced the terrorist and the apartheid spy, penal violence is still targeted at racialized people. So it's so I, it's, it's therefore it's important to study the infrastructures of extrajudicial punishment, precisely because they are not just objects, but they are lively sites of meaning making. Thanks, I will stop there. <laughs>